All right. Can everyone hear me okay? All right. Well, today we are going to talk about uh, security awareness, uh, specifically what I call uh, cyber insanity, uh, which is security awareness and all the things we're doing wrong, which essentially guarantee our failure. Uh, real quickly, though, breaking news, there's a new type of malware, or actually ransomware, that was just discovered uh, by one of my researchers. Uh, and they call it PBS because once a week, it stops your computer and asks for more money. Anyone? Tough crowd. Is this thing on? <laughs> All right. Uh, so quick, quick uh, show of hands. Who thinks that uh, cyber defenders were doing a good job right now? Okay, I'm glad no one had raised their hand. I would have picked on you the rest of the, uh, the talk. Uh, so this is what I call cyber insanity. And so on one side, we have you know a couple breach statistics. Like, for example, uh, right now our detection times have actually uh, rose to the point that they are over 90 days. Uh, they're going up every single year. On top of that, we have more breaches. You don't even need a statistic for that. All you have to do is turn on the news, and you'll see that we're having more and more breaches, uh, very high-profile ones as well. Any security control as it sits right now can easily be bypassed by a skilled uh, hacker. On top of that, the number of ransomware incidents that we're having as an industry, they're increasing, they're going up, and uh, basically a good hacker just can't be stopped the way things are right now. And so on the other side of things though, it, we have more spending than we've ever had before. It's at a record high. In fact, spending is going up by approximately 10% every year. And between 2017 and 2021, it's expected that uh, cybersecurity spending will exceed $1 trillion. Now, that's not cleaning up from breaches. Uh, that is specifically just on defenses, your staff, your personnel, things like that. It has nothing to do with the expense of actually cleaning up from a breach. So to me, I say, you know, in no world is backwards movement progress. We're spending more, yet we're doing worse. And uh, a, couple, a couple things that, that contribute to that, number one, and a big pet peeve of mine, is that we still see compliance as a finish line instead of the starting point. The starting line is, is compliance. It's the bare minimum set of standards that we're supposed to have in place in order to be compliant, not secure, compliant. So it shouldn't be our, our destination, it should be our starting point. Yet what happens? Our, these companies take years becoming compliant and in the process uh, never truly get security because they're not worried about best practices, they're not worried about the risk, they're worried about compliance. And so that, that brings me to the next thing, budget. It's driven by compliance more so than it's ever driven by risk. Uh, anyone see the uh, phishing statistic in the 2018 uh, Verizon DBIR? Anyone know the number? How many uh, incidents started with a fish? 96%. Now, if I were to ask for a quick show of hands, how many people spend more than 5% of their total security budget on security awareness? I don't see a lot of hands. So I'm guessing there's definitely not a 10%. Oh, I still got a couple of hands. 20%? Okay, well, I got to talk to you later. Uh, but, <laughs> but the whole point is most organizations are spending around 5% of their budget on 90% of their problem. The math just doesn't add up. On top of that, we're very pro uh, reactive in cybersecurity. And, and the example I'll give is the risk that quantum computing poses to our current encryption uh, standards. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this guy knows. And so what we're doing is uh, the offensive side of things, like the NSA, our intelligence agencies, and not just ours, other countries too, they are massively gathering every bit of encrypted traffic that they can get their hands on, and they're storing it because they know in just a couple of years that encryption will be worthless. And so then you ask some cyber defenders, well, what about quantum computing and the risk that it poses? And they say, well, the problem will create a solution. The problem with that is we don't need a solution later, a few years from now. We need a solution to this problem right now. So we're very reactive as an industry. Uh, we're not future-proofing our technology. 
And most importantly, we're treating symptoms instead of the root cause. So 96% uh, of fishes, they start, or, I'm sorry, breaches start with fish. Well, what, do we, what types of technology do we put in place to prevent the, the fish from uh, actually getting malware on the computer? Antivirus. We've got our malware and uh, web filters to help block sites that might be distributing malware. Uh, we've got sandboxes to help identify malicious files and uh, payloads ahead of time and block them and distribute definitions. All of these are treating symptoms. What's the problem? People are clicking on things. So if we can treat that at its source, we can have better results than all of these other tools combined that do nothing but treat symptoms. And uh, the next one is that we have some dangerous misconceptions. I know at a point in my career, I've even been guilty of it. Has anyone ever said you can't patch stupid? <laughs> and, and if you give up and if you accept that as reality, you've, you've quit or you've accepted failure before you even got started. Now, I will say the person driving behind me uh, when I was on 131 coming into the conference today, they might fall into that you can't patch stupid group because they're driving, holding onto their cell phone, and watching a video on it uh, the entire time behind me. Uh, so there are a few people that might fall into that, but we can do a lot more and we can do a lot better. And uh, then lastly, uh, cybersecurity is not a technology problem. Cybersecurity is a human problem. See, uh, security, it's composed of multiple layers. Everyone's heard of the onion analogy. And uh, because it's composed of multiple layers, what does every single layer have in common? People. People are involved. And with your users, they basically guarantee a hacker can get into your network. Because they're going to click on something, they're going to get themselves infected, or just give away their credentials and let you log in through the VPN if we don't have multi-factor on uh, everything on our perimeter. But that's still an issue, believe it or not. Um, and, and so what happens is you have users guarantee I can get in. IT ops, through their mistakes, guarantee that I can get full access and full control of everything. And then because most defenders are not up on all the latest tactics, they guarantee we don't get caught. And that tends to be the human problem of cybersecurity. And I, I also pose this. Why attack the perimeter when you can attack the user? I don't want to be in your DMZ. More likely to get caught, much more hardened, much more monitored. No, I want to be where your data is. Your data is where your users are, especially your unstructured data. You're not even monitoring that. Uh, so that's where the hackers want to be. And until we fix that, uh, they're going to continue to target your people until they're no longer the low-hanging fruit. Uh, so how do we fix this problem? And don't take this too literally, but it's meant to sort of get, get a point across. So how do we fix the problem? Well, we stop educating. Because, see, humans are a little bit like computers. They're very difficult to train, but easy to program. Think about it. If we use psychological tactics, the same social engineering tactics that we use in our offensive emulations or that the bad guys use against us, in order to get our users to actually pay attention, we can have much, much better results. And I'll talk more about that as we go. So before I jump in uh, to the top 10 mistakes that uh, most, uh, most programs are making in their security awareness, I want to cover what I call the four E's of security awareness. Um, number one, and it's very important, it must be entertaining. Has anyone gone through the DOD uh, security awareness training? Was that not the most miserable thing you ever did in your life? <laughs> I got two hands out of that guy. <laughs> so it, it's boring. So we got to make our content more entertaining. Uh, it needs to be encompassing. You have different people in different roles of your organization that have different training requirements. I know that's a lot of difference, uh, but you have different, uh, multiple needs. IT ops, they need to be educated about the common mistakes so that they can avoid them. Your developers need uh, education about uh, secure coding practices or OWASP training. And your incident responders and anyone involved in that needs incident response training so that they're not running around like chickens with their head cut off the first time they see a seven-figure incident. Anyone ever been involved in one of those? Yeah, that's some craziness, isn't it? And you're not going to sleep for days when that does happen. Uh, so next, it needs to be engaging. Engaging is more than just getting the users to actually uh, pay attention. It's getting them to report. 
We don't just want them to not click on a fish, we want them to report the fish. And that's when they truly become part of our human firewall, if you will, when they're not just blocking, they're also reporting. But all of that doesn't matter unless it's effective. Effective, the way you measure that is simply one thing. Is it lowering the amount of incidents we have? There's a lot of great metrics like percentage of users clicking on fishes. But at the end of the day, that's not as important of a metric as are we reducing our number of incidents. In fact, in all of security, I would argue that's always your most important metric. That's always the thing you should be comparing everything else to. Because if you're not driving down incidents, your program is not working. What Your investments are not working. Maybe because you didn't invest enough into uh, training or people, or it could be because the tool just doesn't work. Uh, but if you're not driving incidents down, you're not being effective. So with that, what just happened? OK, bear with me. Apparently, I hit the uh, end button for the slideshow. Uh, so the top 10 epic security awareness fails. So that brings us to number 10. And defenders, don't take this the wrong way. Uh, but most defenders, most people running these programs are overworked. Has anyone ever heard of a properly staffed information security team? Anyone? OK, I didn't think so. Uh, but also, not only are, are most defenders overworked because they have way too many dashboards, but they don't understand psychology. They're information security people, not educators, not psychologists yet they still got put in charge of running a security awareness program. We wonder why it doesn't work. Um, do-it-yourself programs, they're underutilized. Uh, anyone have an underutilized do-it-yourself, uh, let's say, phishing tool in their company? OK, I've seen quite a few. So yeah, the best do-it-yourself program in the world is only as good as how well you use it. So I could go buy a, you know, I don't know, I'm trying to think of some power tool to use as an analogy. Not thinking of it right now. But I can, I can buy a tool, but if I never use that tool, it's worthless. It has no value. So it doesn't matter how great of a technology is, it has to be used in order to be successful. A uh, quick little true story about uh, a client of mine. And this is a very, very common story. Uh, but let's just say this is extreme critical infrastructure, this client. Uh, they have 2,500 employees. But any major incident with them could cause massive, massive problems for the entire United States. Uh, so they have 2,500 employees, designated US critical infrastructure. They have a, a team of three cybersecurity people, one of which was the CISO. So two cybersecurity people. No offense, CISOs. Uh, but they have a team of, of, of three people total. And uh, they're already dealing with dashboard overload. Uh, overload. They can't keep up with their alerts. They can't keep up with everything that they have to do. So the CTO, uh, without even consulting their technology team, they say, we're going to buy No Before. And, hey, it's a great price. It's a great tool. Uh, so nothing against No Before, but if it's not used, it's worthless. And so what happens? At the end of the year, they sent a total of two fishes with that tool. Uh, Two fishes is not much. That's an underutilized tool. And yes, we did gain full control of everything, including their critical infrastructure controls, where we could do things like cause massive national disasters or disruptions uh, to the US economy and, and fun stuff like that. So this is a typical story. I, I, I pick on them because this was an extreme example. But how many people see stuff like this every day? Probably in your own companies. Oh, he was taking a picture. I'll rewind for a second. Oh, wait, well, hey, there we are. <laughs> yeah, OK. And I think the slides will be online later if you want them, so you can grab them. Anyway, so the next thing, number nine, uh, is poor user engagement. No. <laughs> yeah, I forgot I had that meme on there. <laughs> uh, so most users, they simply don't care. And they don't care for a number of reasons. And, and we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, later. Uh, but most often, one of the biggest reasons they don't care is because management doesn't care. There's not a security culture, so they don't see it as important. There's no ramifications if they do something stupid to, because it's cyber. It's a computer. What's the worst that happens? They get their machine re-imaged. They lose a couple hours worth of work. That's their penalty for getting the network infected, which could have cost the company billions. It, 
Uh, and that's, that's good. And I, I've seen a lot more of it. I will say carrots are way more valuable than sticks. Uh, we need to be doing as much as we can with carrots. And then if we've done a, m a bunch with carrots and we're still not getting anywhere, then we have all the uh, documentation we need to start using sticks and getting HR involved. Um, users also have a false sense of security. This was one that sort of surprised me. Uh, we interviewed a bunch of users and uh, started asking them why, why they might do you know, certain things. And uh, they basically said, it doesn't matter what I do. My network is so secure, I couldn't possibly get it infected. <laughs> but it's a thing because they have to go through so many steps just to get logged into their computer in the morning and so many steps to get a new piece of software put on their computer that they actually believe there's not a possible way that they could get the network infected. No penalties for dangerous behavior. No rewards for secure behavior. Uh, another big one is we're missing top-down support. I, I see companies, they, they come and they, they hire my company to take over their security awareness, and that's great. And the first thing we ask for during the kickoff, we need an email to go out from your CEO. Nine times out of 10, guess who that comes from? The CISO, who no one cares about. I mean, it's not that they shouldn't, it's that the CEO is the one, if they say, I'm doing this, this is important, this is a core uh, or a new thing with our company and you better take it seriously, they'll take it seriously. Anyone under the CEO says the same thing, they probably won't even read the email. Uh, we're missing emotional tie-in with, with what we're doing in our initiatives. And I have a whole slide for that later, so I won't jump into it just yet. Um, and then we're not giving users performance feedback. Hey, great job. You avoided clicking on that fish. Oops, you clicked on this fish. Here's some things you could have uh, used to, to avoid clicking on it. Hey, you're now considered low risk. You're now considered high risk. Things like that help get them involved in their own education instead of being a bystander uh, in the process. Next is poor or missing data collection. And, and basically, when it comes to human security, this is pretty much how it is right now. The best we have is, did they click on a fish? Yes or no, which fish? Nothing more. We're not really looking at a lot of data around users. And so you, know, you can't fix what you don't measure. So here's a couple of things that we could be looking at. The obvious, you know, uh, how many fish clicks does this user have? Everyone's doing that, or most people are. What about this one? What types of fishes are they clicking on? Are we ranking or, our, or categorizing our fishes so that we can find trends within that? In fact, uh, we discovered that sales and developers are typically, in most companies, uh, the most vulnerable to phishing. But they don't click on the same types of fishes. Sales clicks on social media style fishes. Developers, they're clicking on uh, operational and security related fishes. Very different type of susceptibility, but they're both clicking on a lot of fishes. Uh, how many of your employees are participating and at what level? Uh, what does each employee need to improve on in order to get better? Uh, how long before a user relapses? This is a fun one that, that we've been tracking. If you know when they relapse, so let's say you, you get them down to the low risk group. They're not clicking on much. And then you monitor them and you find out that after four months of a, a lightened sort of security, uh, I, I guess, delivery to them, that they relapse and they start clicking. Well, couldn't we increase the amount of training, the amount of phishing emulations at three months and prevent them from ever having relapsed in the first place? So we can get do a lot more with data and so there, there's so many more points that, that we're even collecting, and at that, I guarantee I've missed some. So I leave you with, if you can think it, measure it. I mean, you can have data just sit there that you never use, but you can't get data back if you never measured it in the first place. Uh, the next is uh, poor risk insight. And uh, sorry, excuse me. I, I guess I left my water over there. Uh, but what are my KPIs in, in terms of uh, risk? And uh, Thank you, sir. What are my KPIs? How do I know if what I'm doing is working? Uh, other things like uh, what employees do I have that are, are most at risk? Do I have different departments that are more at risk than other departments? Should maybe they be segmented off into a separate VLAN like sales, marketing? Uh, they're, they're, they're always clicking on these sort of, sort of things. And if we know this, we can do something about it. What about location-based? Do you have a, a, some locations that are less security aware than others? 
Could it tie back to a manager that really pushes security or doesn't care about security? Is it a cultural thing? And what can we do with that? Um, I guess I just covered that. And then other things, like who's improving? Who's not improving? I mean, you could be my, my worst clicker uh, right now, and then three months from now, be one of my most secure users. And I don't care that you were a very high risk user at the beginning. But what if you're that one that sort of slips through the side, and you're never high risk, but you're always just moderate risk again and again and again? Who's improving? Who's not? And uh, yeah, I already hit that. Uh, so other than that, what about sensitive information users? Are your domain admins clicking on fishes? If they are, should they have domain admin privileges? <laughs> what about your HR department? They have access to all kinds of PII. <laughs> so, but this is why we need to track it, because these users pose more risk to our organization. So when we're tracking who's clicking on fishes, for example, why aren't we looking at, are any of these people deemed a sensitive information user? So. Uh, here are some numbers, and, and I show this because low percentages matter, and in the next slide we'll go into a little bit more about why. Uh, but most of our clients, after they've done a do-it-yourself program, they come to us. We see them starting around 6.5%, and this is where we haven't been able to get below because it's sort of human randomness. But at 0.13% of your users clicking on a fish, it becomes almost impossible to fish your, uh, to fish your organization and get somebody to actually click. I've hired pen testers to spearfish my clients before and had 0% click-through rate and 75% reporting because you drove the numbers that low. So here's the reason 98% of your users not clicking doesn't matter. It barely scratches the surface. So we took all of our data and we said, I want to know how much uh, risk is posed by what group or what percentage of users. And I was even surprised by it. 1.19% of users represented 89.82% of total phishing risk. It's insane. So when you hear all these claims from these awareness companies, we'll get 98% to stop clicking. They haven't even touched your risk. And that's, I mean, we have to start driving risk down. 98%, it's a, it's a number that sounds good, but it's all marketing. It means nothing. So number six, low frequency training. Anyone guilty of doing once a year training? So if you do once a year training, it could be the best once a year training. And your users could, could really enjoy it and leave security evangelists. Three months down the road, they already forgot about that. <laughs> they, they don't remember. And they've already moved on. And so you have to be doing more to keep security front of mind. Uh, so we, we have this lack of repetition in it. Um, we're not keeping it front of mind. Uh, we're not taking advantage of all touch points. Has anyone deployed security awareness uh, desktop backgrounds to their users' computers? I like it. Good job. What about, I, I see people put it in the newsletter that no one reads. What about putting a security awareness message in the pay stub? People might read that a little bit more. Uh, <laughs> so that there's more places. And, and I guess the thing that I, I would encourage is integrate everywhere. If you can think of a place where people will see it, put it there. Put it in the break rooms. Uh, put it on your intranet and in the form of advertisements. Heck, I, I have uh, one client we're working on right now doing a remarketing campaign. So this is basically using Google AdSense to cookie all of their users' uh, browsers and make sure that they get security awareness messages popping up all over the internet wherever they go. You can do that too. It costs a little bit of money, but not much, honestly. Uh, our threats, and I guess this is the biggest thing, is that our threats are evolving daily, not on a yearly or quarterly basis. So our training shouldn't be done once a year, and generally it's the exact same training we gave for the last 10 years, at least the DOD stuff is. Uh, so we, we need our, to evolve our training to adapt to uh, modern threats. And then we have over-complex messaging. When you only do one training a year, or one training a quarter, what happens? Well, we have to go into the 17 ways to avoid clicking on a fish, blah, 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 BS, because no one's going to listen. They're already intimidated by cybersecurity. And because they're intimidated, if we get into the weeds and we don't simplify our messaging, we lose all of the, our efforts on deaf ears. Um, so the next one is uh, there are boring content. Uh, I'm going to pick on SANS, uh, Securing the Human. Uh, right now because they're they're great. They were one of the first to say let's shorten 
the videos or the, the education. And so they, they reduced them down to about three and a half minutes. Three and a half very boring minutes. I love the approach. I love their goal. But I think they stopped just short of it because it's over complex. It's boring. And uh, I think, you know, we can do better. But they're an example of somebody that's doing good in this industry. Now, in just a bit, I'm going to play you two awareness videos. And I'll bet you every person in here laughs and enjoys them and remembers them long after uh, I leave. So content's way too lengthy. Um, we have over complex messaging. Our content doesn't entertain our users. It, it tends to intimidate users on top of it. And uh, basically, it's just painful to watch. We can do a lot better at making everything we do entertaining and simplifying our message. Uh, you know, a lot of comedians will, will quite literally take hours and hours trying to take a 10-word sentence and get it down to five words. You know, we need to take the same sort of approach in our security awareness as simplifying our messaging. Do we actually need to tell them that? Or is just simply saying, think before you click, enough? So here is a quick video about malware. Hopefully you enjoy. For sake of time, I'm going to jump through because I don't want to run out and I want to have time for questions. Uh, but that's malware. Do you think they're going to remember it? OK. And did we use emotions in there to help anchor it? We got humor or entertainment. That's a form of emotion. We also have fear factor that's in there. Both emotions, both going to help make sure that they don't soon forget they don't want to be the one that unleashed malware on the entire network. I think a lot of users think that, oh, well, it'll just affect my computer. It's not like it's going to spread to every computer in the network or anything. All right, so here's the next one. Helen, your account has been hacked. Somebody guessed your password. Well, how did they know? I, I picked something so random. Was it dolphin? I've got to take this. Hello? So... The whole point there is that we can do so much more. And in the days of YouTube and uh, the Fair Use Act, because this is uh, for educational purposes, it's so easy to create very entertaining videos on a very low budget. Just yeah, find a, a great YouTube that clip that sort of fits, source it, and there you are. You're good to go. And, and by the way, you can. It, it's education. You can get away with using almost anything off of YouTube, just FYI. Um, so the next one is that our, our programs tend to be one size fits all. Uh, anyone have adaptive sort of education uh, initiatives that you're doing that, you know, customize to the individual user needs? Okay, I'm not seeing many hands, or I didn't see any hands actually. Uh, so what we're doing is one size fits all. Well, what's the problem with one size fits all? You're, you're basing everything on the median, the, the person that's right in the middle. You're not, you're giving the people that are secure way too much content, and you're giving the people that aren't secure way too little content. Uh, so the next thing is that our, our phishing exercises, like just like our, our training, they don't adapt either. So if you're susceptible to, let's say, social media-themed fishes, why don't we start beating you up on social media-themed fishes until you're not susceptible anymore? We can adapt our, our education and our initiatives to get better results simply by customizing it to the risk and needs of the individual user. Next, different people represent different risk. I've talked about this. I've hit on it quite a few times. But we need to be able to adapt to those individual needs. Uh, not everyone uh, needs the same training. So you've got a lot of people that don't need as much as they're getting. In business, what's the holy grail? Don't we always want to do more with less? You actually can when it comes to education. You can do way more with less because 98% of your users aren't a problem, which means you can lower the amount of education you're giving them 
and at the exact same time increase uh, as much as you possibly need to with your high risk users, the users posing a great deal of risk in order to actually remediate them and get them to quit clicking on these things. And all of these, by the way, uh, are applicable to other forms of social type attacks such as vishing, uh, but it, this is heavily focused on phishing because that's our biggest threat right now. All right, so uh, the next thing is not everyone learns the same. Give them options on how to learn. Maybe I want to watch a funny video, but maybe Joe down the hallway just wants to read about it because it's quicker for him to read a quick paragraph or a couple sentences about security. So give them the ability to learn in the way that they personally want to. And yeah, it's just not efficient to do one size fits all uh, education. And different roles have different training needs. Uh, most places are not doing enough with role-based training. So you let's let's take incident response, for example. You do the tabletop exercise. You get a couple key people that are involved in incident response at that table, but you don't get representation from everybody, like the average help desk employee who's going to be the front lines and identify that and have to escalate it to you and escalate it properly. Uh, you don't get everyone from legal and PR and upper management that's going to be involved in it uh, at the table. So you get a few key stakeholders, and they're probably not even going to properly communicate everything down to the people beneath them. Uh, so you can do more if you get everybody involved and do role-based training that's sort of ongoing, as opposed to these one-time uh, sort of binge training type activities that we tend to do. So I ask you, are you setting yourself up for failure? Number three, missing just-in-time engagement. So uh, I presume a bunch of people here probably run phishing emulations. All right, who exploits their users? OK, but you're a pen tester, right? OK. Uh, well, I don't blame you. <laughs> Actually, a uh, quick tip on these CTFs. Uh, one of the easiest ways to win is just to uh, SSH into any Cali box you find using root tor because these people doing CTF uh, tend to use that a lot and brick their machine. <laughs> you just got rid of one bit of competition. So <laughs> I've never done that before. Uh, but we're missing just in time. So at the moment a mistake is realized, users are uniquely susceptible to learning. And so if they click on a fish that's meant for education, not pen testing, but if they click on a fish and we say, OK, will they type in their username and password? Maybe they will. But maybe there's a zero day. Does it really matter? It's game over already. And by exploiting them, we're missing out on a valuable educational opportunity. And I'm going to show you a sample landing page that will get their attention a heck of a lot more and make sure that they don't soon forget that they shouldn't be clicking on fishes in uh, just a second here. And it'll do a lot better than seeing what they'll give you. It's game over. They clicked. Um, so uh, next is not using it. It's just wasted opportunity. It's a valuable play time that you can uh, educate people, and you have that emotional anchor. It's embarrassment. It doesn't matter what the or what the emotion is. If they're embarrassed, they're going to pay attention. Um, we're missing follow-up emails. How many people, the second somebody clicks on a fish, uh, have an email waiting in the user's inbox saying, "Oops, you clicked on a fish. Here's the fish you clicked on, and here were the red flags." Anyone? Okay, we got one guy, two, three people. So I see a few people, but I guess that means. For the rest of us, when your users click on a fish, they may not even know they clicked on a fish, especially if we're exploiting them, which means we're missing that opportunity to educate. Uh, I've just talked about that. And then what about your super high risk users? Like, I like to call them the chronic clickers. Did you know that just a simple phone call that creates a human connection will actually get them to stop clicking on fishes or, or in most cases, reduce the amount of risk that they pose to the organization? You don't have to tell them, hey, you're, you're doing horrible. You're clicking on everything. You don't have to train them. Just simply saying, hey, I see you've been struggling with the phishing emulations. Just want you to know we're in InfoSec. We're here. If you have any questions, feel free to pick up the phone. You created a human connection, and now they care a little bit more. And they, it, nine times out of 10, that's one of the most effective calls you can make. So we're not doing enough with that. And then we have these overly complex landing pages. I've seen a bunch of them where it's like, uh, 17 ways to avoid clicking on a fish. That's, it's not going to work. So I'll show you an example in just a bit. Uh, but here's what I sort of do for the just-in-time 
you know, hey, you clicked on a fish, and here's what you could have noticed. And that way they know they clicked, and they can get better and avoid clicking on it in the future. Now, who wants to see a, a fun landing page? And I want to show a hands on anyone who thinks this landing page would be effective. <laughs> do we need to give them 17 ways to avoid clicking on a fish? Or do you think they got their lesson? All right, so I ask, are you setting yourself up for failure in your security awareness initiatives? Number two, biggest mistake that we make is missing emotional anchoring. Emotional anchoring is proven to deliver better results in education. There's been a million studies done on it, uh, not specific to cybersecurity, but in terms of psychology and education in general. And they've always found that when you can get an emotional tie-in, doesn't matter what the emotion, that there is a significantly higher retention rate uh, with that education. So we need to do more with emotional anchoring. Um, it, does, it increases retention. It builds impact. It pushes engagement. And, well, it's scientifically proven. Which brings me to our number one biggest mistake that almost every corporation is making in their awareness training, and that is they are, have well, I call lousy human virus definitions. What's that mean? We're not fishing enough. How do we implant human virus definitions? We do it by fishing our users. So uh, this, this meme, I love it. What if I told you the best antivirus is your brain? Well, that is the truth. If we want to stop malware, we can do it better than ever by simply changing our user behavior. I have a client that saw a 98% reduction in their incidents simply through changing user behavior. When you get 99.9% .9 of users to stop clicking on things, guess what? You'll see that in your bottom line. You will have incident responders that are bored to death. Maybe they can go and, and stop, you know, and actually move into uh, proactive type security when they're not busy putting out fires because people are clicking on things. Uh, so more phishing just creates more virus definitions or more human virus definitions. I, I like to say like this. I, I, I'll hear executives argue, well, we can't do fish that often. It causes business disruption. We only do it once a quarter or whatever they happen to say. And to that I say, Okay, so you only want the bad guys in your user's inbox then, right? Because that's their choice. The bad guys are already there. So the question is whether or not you're going to be in their inbox too. All right, next is uh, we, we need to condition our users to watch for red flags. This thing, phenomena that I've seen, uh, we have very interactive, so we, we work with our users. We get a lot of feedback from our users that we're educating. And it's funny, when, they, when we first started this massive and rapid frequent uh, fishing exercises, they hate us for it. We get, we've got cussed out a few times. Um, <laughs> but a few months in, they're like, oh man, I'm getting good at this. Give me harder fishes. And then a few months after that, what I really like and what I see that happens is they'll come back and they'll say, I don't even have to open the email anymore to know it's a fish. Because the subconscious is now picking up on the red flags. They may not even know why, but they know they don't trust it and they just move on. And that is effective uh, trading. Next is that uh, all trending threats should really, really be accompanied by uh, an emulation or a simulation. So uh, any pen testers in here? OK, we got a couple. And uh, have you ever seen the IT director cheat? You send them the fish ahead of time to get approval to send it out. And then they forward it to the entire organization. They say, don't click on this. Well. I see it all the time because they say that and as soon as they click on it inevitably and give me their credentials and I log into their email, I see they opened my fish, but they didn't open the email from the security department warning them about the fish. And so it, it's a common thing. So how can we have better results? If we have a trending threat against our company or against our industry, what if instead we weaponize that fish and run a phishing emulation? The people who would have fallen for it in the first place are now going to fall for yours. They're going to get the educational message, and they're now over 70% less likely to click on the fish if they see it in the wild. So instead of sending out alerts, let's fish them anytime we have an active trending threat. 
And the next thing is that the only way to uh, fix spear phishing is by spear phishing. I, I have a benefits change spear fish that if I do it in an average pen test, I'll see 20 to 30% of people click on it. Whereas if I do it uh, against users that have been going through this program and been fished for quite some time on a regular basis, you might see a 0.25% click rate. That's a big difference. You can prevent spear phishing, but you can only do it by spear phishing your users. I, I never have a single month that goes by that I don't spear fish at least every single user in every organization that I work with once. Most of the time, it's twice every month. Uh, just depends. Next is that, uh, well, I just said that users are 75% or 70% less likely to click on a fish if they first see it from you, which means we've got to get the, uh, the attacks in front of them. So the top 10 recap. Number 10, we have underqualified and overworked staff running our security training programs. Remember, our, our InfoSec people are great but they're InfoSec people, they're not educators, they are not psychologists 99% of the time, and so they are not the best skilled and qualified person to be running your security training initiatives because I promise they'll get into the weeds really quickly. Um, as a manager, that, I mean, I run a lot of pen tests, uh, and I, I find just the, when they're writing up a pen test report, I have to be like, no, come on, you're getting way too into the weeds here, and that's on a technical document, let alone actual educational initiatives. Number nine, poor user engagement. We're just not doing enough to make our users care and get them engaged in their own education and the security of the company. Maybe they don't even know that if they cause a massive breach, it could lead to layoffs. Uh, next is that we have poor or missing data collection. Uh, we have, uh, number seven, we have poor risk insight. So we don't understand our human risk. I assign a high, medium, and low risk to every single user on an, uh, every single month. That's good data. What can you do with it? You can take your high-risk group and you can segment them off. You can restrict their access if they have sensitive access or access to sensitive information. So you need to be doing more with that. Number six, low-frequency training. Uh, number five is boring content. We're, I think we're all sick of the boring content. Number four is one-size-fits-all initiatives. They're just not uh, adaptive enough and my favorite, though, is adaptive fishing. You can get amazing results there. Figure out what they're susceptible to and beat up on them. After a little while, you'll find out that they're no longer susceptible to that. And then you got to find out what they're now susceptible to, and you beat up on them on that for a while. And sooner before you know it, they're not clicking on fishes anymore. Uh, number three is, is missing out on that just-in-time sort of opportunity, or I call it JIT. Uh, training. So every time a mistake is realized, that's an opportunity to educate them. Make sure that they have content in their inbox before they get back there. Have an effective and simple landing page. It could be nothing more than the words think before you click, uh, but something to get the message across to them at the moment that mistake is realized. Number two is that missing emotional anchoring. Anything you can do to get the users emotionally involved is going to increase the probability of success. So when I do the once a year in person sort of three hour long security awareness training, I sit there the entire time and I watch the audience and I make sure that they are lean forward and on the edge of their seats. And if they aren't, well, this is, I see them leaning up. <laughs> and if they aren't, I go right to fear tactics. I go immediately to telling them what the consequences of a security breach could mean to them and their company and their paycheck. And you know what happens? They start leaning forward again. And so we need to do more with that emotional anchoring because it gets their attention and it helps make sure that they don't soon forget the lesson that you're, uh, you're giving them. And number one is just lousy human virus definitions. We have got to do better about phishing our users. I, it's my belief that no user in any company should be phished less than two times per month. So think about the, the employee who's a low risk. They don't click on fishes normally. But let's say this guy, he goes home, and he gets there, and there's a, a letter from his wife on the counter. And it says, I've decided to leave you. I want a divorce. I've taken the kids. Do you think that might affect his risk when he comes back into work the next day? He's going to be preoccupied. So if we're not fishing regularly, 
how long might it take us to determine that that person is at risk? Furthermore, I found uh, eight different categories or types of fishes, and different people are susceptible to these. So if you only fish once per quarter, it could take you up to two years if you're tracking your fishes and know what category of fishes you've actually sent to identify one of your risky employees, which means all that time during the two years, they could have been getting you infected, causing you issues, and you didn't know because you're not fishing your users enough. And of course, we need better virus definitions. Uh, you'd be amazed at how effective just making sure they see all the fishes from you first is at preventing them from clicking on just about anything. So with that, it brings me to my closing thoughts before I open it up for uh, questions, and that is this. Would any of you let your 13-year-old or 12-year-old or whatever climb into a car without any training, without a license, never did the permit, and go drive down to their friend's house or across the town or across the state? Would anyone let their kid do that? Why? <laughs> they might kill themselves. So. I draw this analogy because when we let users onto our networks and we give them access to our most sensitive data and our most sensitive systems, all without proper training, they might kill our, co kill our companies, kill our business. It's not a whole lot different. And when the types of pen tests that I do, human lives are actually at stake. I've done so many pen tests where we took control of systems that could have easily killed people. Everything from hospitals over to oil rigs that if I had spun them up could have killed somebody and a million other things in between. So in cybersecurity, it is life or death in many cases with many organizations and we've got to do better at educating our users. So with that I ask, are you setting yourself up for failure? Thank you. Questions? So we've actually developed a, an executive level uh, training. And so basically, we, we walk them through and give them a framework to help them uh, better run their, all of their cyber initiatives. And actually, we give them a formula on how to uh, measure the success of their initiatives as well. Uh, but it's actually a, a completely separate training we do for executives. And we use a lot of fear in that one, too. We typically use their actual vulnerabilities as sort of an introduction to their risk. And uh, it starts something like, hey, I talked to your IT director, and I asked him five questions, and I found five vulnerabilities, and here's how that leads to a complete compromise. And uh, that gets their attention, and then we walk them through a framework on how to, how to effectively run it. And typically, they'll start finding their own vulnerabilities by applying the framework in a couple hours. Any other questions? Wow, this is a, well, OK, yes. Sounds more like a statement than a question behind you. <laughs> oh, all the time. Uh, you must not have caught my talk yesterday. <laughs> yes, we absolutely do. I can give you a card after it. There's 20 different factors that play into it for us, but it's really as simple as are they clicking on things, how much are they clicking on, how frequently are they clicking on them. Uh, but we also look at other things, like are they engaging in education? You know, if they're not clicking on anything, I don't care if they're at how engaged they are in the education. But the second they start clicking on stuff, now all of a sudden that metric matters as well. Yeah, agreed. And it's funny, half the time they do report it, they lie. Uh, they'll say, oh, I didn't click on anything. They should be reporting.
Yeah. 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 This is well. Yeah. I, I will say nothing about creating an effective security awareness program is easy or won't require a ton of effort. I mean, it, it, there's the the methodologies and the framework. And by the way, you can check out humansam.org. Uh, it's my human security assurance maturity model project. Uh, right now, it's nothing but these methodologies on there. But if you apply these methodologies, you can be more successful. Uh, yes. Let me find out. Yes. So, the biggest problem I run into, I work at a technical organization, so quote unquote, we're going to hold conferences at night. They try to be a little too simple, and people are just like, not asking for money, but money. Um, so, <laughs> half the people who click it know they click it. How do you deal with those people who say, oh, I'm smarter than this, I know this bad, I clicked it twice and it worked? Uh, you still click it. They clicked. I mean, so that's making them a part of their own success. As soon as they get put into the high-risk user group because they clicked on that, they'll change their attitude real quickly that next month. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, everybody, so much. It was a pleasure.